you've seen the consumer change a little bit. Um, everyone's very respectful about wearing masks. I think, I think society as a whole has changed quite a bit in the last five weeks, actually. And, and I think, um, I think you're going to start seeing um, a, a pretty significant comeback to Las Vegas, but that's based upon, that's based upon some of these numbers coming down. I don't want to share someone else's thoughts. I want to create my own original thoughts. I want to create my own original solutions. I want to look at situations and come up with my own phrasing, my own words, and do it my way. This is the John Taffer Podcast. Shut it down. Well, hello, everybody. Here we are. It's John Taffer. What the hell episode is this, uh, Corey? Episode number 20. Episode 20. Wow. So uh, uh, here we go, guys. I'm sitting here in Las Vegas in my... Uh, I guess I'm pretty blessed. I got a really nice house here in Vegas, and, and uh, we're redoing some work in my yard, so my house is a mess right now. But I think, Corey, I am approaching 130 days of quarantine, other than my Ooh. bus trip to see my daughter. And I was quarantined in a bus. Right. I'll still count that. I'll still yep. count okay. that. So, so uh, <laughs> I'm getting up there. But you know what's interesting? I'm sitting here, and I'm saying to myself, we're now six months into this, Corey. Yep. Everything that I've seen research-wise, you know, we have this Oxford vaccine, which is going to be ready by the end of September. There's about 123 vaccines in various levels uh, of trials. So I think, Corey, it's pretty safe for you and I to say we are going to have a vaccine. We're probably going to have that vaccine early 21, right, first quarter of 21. But there's a real shot that you might actually get that vaccine or I might actually get that vaccine before the end of the year. Okay. Well, I'm sitting here in July. The end of the year is six months from now. Yeah, it's coming quick. And I'm, we are six months into this now. Right. So how about looking at it this way? Corey, every day I'm getting closer to the end of this now than I am the beginning. Exactly. That's a great way to look at it. Yeah. And, and I'm starting to feel that now. You know, treatments are happening. Vaccines are moving along. You know, uh, uh, uh I think we can all talk about a lack of leadership in, in some of our governmental programs and that kind of stuff. And I don't want to go there today. That's not what I'm talking about. But I want this to be an inspirational message. And I just did some Fox News this morning. And I was saying, guys, close your eyes. In 2021, there's going to be restaurants. There's going to be bars. Yeah. We are going to be going out. We're going to be enjoying ourselves. Yes, we will be going to sports games at some point. Yeah. So we're dealing with time. And I suggest that for the first six months, the last six months, that clock was ticking up. Now, I believe that clock is ticking down. And that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So if we just hold on to that premise, we need to deal with time. And, you know, many of us are going to go through some career changes as this happens. And jobs, yep, are going to disappear, some of them, and they're going to change. And more automation is going to happen and, and different procedures and things are going to happen that's going to evolve the workplace. And there's a large percentage of us that are going to wind up making career changes. Some of us might open new businesses. Some of us might close businesses and get jobs. But this is clearly a time of transition for all of us. And I was thinking to myself, we've had some great podcasts talking to you, the audience. This week I wanted to think of myself, who is a guy that I know who's an interesting agent of change? You know, a guy who's changed his life in the middle, changed his career. You know, I'm one of those guys. I wasn't in a TV business when I was younger. Corey, it changed my life. I completely reinvented myself. You know, I was a hotel guy, a hotel operator, a bar operator. Now I'm a media guy. So, you know, we do go through these changes in life. And who's a really interesting transformational success story that I can tell? And I thought of Derek Stevens. And Derek Stevens is a, is a phenomenal guy. Derek Stevens is actually was originally a jobber from the Detroit, Michigan area who made automotive components and automotive parts under contract, did well. Always wanted to be in a gaming business. In the middle of his life, he comes to Las Vegas, buys the Golden Gate Hotel and Casino, the oldest building in Las Vegas, Corey, built in 1901. <laughs> Jeez. Never been in a hotel business before. Yeah. You know, he's a jobber. He makes nuts and bolts and parts and, and, and materials for car manufacturing. So now he buys this hotel. Well, it's a small hotel. It wasn't the biggest in Las Vegas. So now he's working in a kitchen himself, and he's working, and he gets involved, and he's engaged, and he's not an investor. He's an operator. And son of a gun, he's running this freaking place. And then he goes and buys another property and converts it to the D in Las Vegas. Now he has two casinos and he's doing really well. And he's involved. And when you go in these places, he's sitting there. And this is a guy who just a few years before made nuts and bolts, was not in the hospitality industry at all. Right. 
And then you find out that he built and acquired the downtown Las Vegas event center. Now he's one of the biggest entertainment operators in town. He's operating concerts and major triple A acts in his event center with the D and he's got one of the coolest bars in the D with the long bar downstairs. And now he's got the classic Golden Gate going and he's got all this going on and now he buys a piece of land and he's gonna spend hundreds of millions of dollars building the first brand new hotel in Las Vegas in about 20 years. Wow. Think about that. All new technologies, new entertainment yeah. formats. Every hotel in Vegas has been remodeled and upgraded, but inherently they're all 20 plus years old. This is a guy who a few years earlier made nuts and bolts in Detroit, Michigan for the hotel industry. Derek has completely reinvented downtown Las Vegas. He's learned a completely new industry. He's inspirational. He's inspiring. He loves his employees. He loves his guests. He's the epitome of success through engagement. And it's a great example for us all. So when I come back, I want to talk to Derek Stevens. And I want to find out what actually motivates a guy to take the levels of risk that Derek takes and to get so involved in everything that you do that you actually control your own success. Not the people that work for him, but he does because he's engaged. Well, Derek, it's great to have you back, buddy. I think you were on a podcast. It was about a year ago. Right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, when I was in the studio, that back in the good old days, huh? You're back in the good old days. Well said. And Circa was really just at that point, it wasn't out of the ground yet. I don't even think it was a hole in the ground yet back then. But, <laughs> right? And now, of course, it, it, it's fun when you live here in Las Vegas. On my way home, I happen to drive past the downtown area of Las Vegas, and I've watched Derek's new hotel Circa come up. And, of course, I, I do work, and so sometimes I don't drive by for a couple of weeks, but about two or three floors every couple of weeks, and it, it's fun to watch it come up. But, you know, I wanted to talk to you about a couple of really interesting things today. You know I love you and, and have huge respect for what you've accomplished, Derek. I mean, you're a Wayne State guy, came here from Michigan with a dream, bought the oldest casino downtown, I believe, right? Wasn't the Golden Gate the original? Yeah, it's the original building in Las Vegas, uh, the original address, one Fremont Street, and uh, yeah, Circa is going to be directly across Fremont Street. So Circa will be the newest, uh, the newest building in Vegas, and right across from the oldest building in, in the history of Las Vegas. Yeah, isn't that wonderful? And, and yeah. you know, so many people in life they say, "Boy, can I change careers? Can I change direction? Can I reinvent myself?" Well, I did, Derek, as you know, with TV. That didn't happen till later in life. You did that because you were in a completely different industry and a completely other side of the country, in the middle of the country, and you wanted to get into this business. So this was passion for you in the beginning, wasn't it? Yeah, it really was. I mean, I always loved Las Vegas, and uh, I had visited Las Vegas many, many times, some for uh, business and conventions and things like that uh, in the automotive industry, and then often for, uh, for pleasure. I mean, I was a uh, always a sports fan. So I was always out here for, uh, you know, the Super Bowls and the big fights and things like that. And uh, yeah, I really came to love Las Vegas. And then, um, you know, when I moved some of my business out here and we bought into the Golden Gate, um, you know, Nevada and Las Vegas was very business friendly. I mean, no income tax out right. here. Uh, they had a lot of incentives to, to, to move to Las Vegas. And uh, we did. And in that time period, I, uh, I had uh, an opportunity to meet a lot of people and, uh, Get into Fremont Street right uh, right as things started to uh, come back a little bit. Yeah, did, did you find that the sense of community in Vegas was greater than you ever thought before you came here? Oh, oh absolutely. Um, you know, I think that's probably one of the things that, uh, you know, as a tourist, um, I, I, I probably really never got the sense of. Um, right. You know, I'd been coming to Vegas for a couple decades, and um, I, I, I really never had – that full understanding of um, how great this city is and uh, and the community of this city. And um, yeah, I, I quickly, uh, I was quickly able to jump into it because, you know, I spent most of my time on Fremont Street and, uh, you know, with it being a little bit of a smaller area, you get to meet a few guys that own uh, restaurants, bars, new startup companies. And yeah, the community was great. And then, you know, as things started growing, um, then all of a sudden you see you see what type of community it is. You can see it with uh, Golden Knights fans. You can see it with uh, 
you know, the outpouring of support when, uh, when there's been a couple of bad things that have happened, uh, you know, around the country or specifically in Vegas, how, how this community comes together. It's actually pretty special, I think. I think so, too. And, and tourists don't get to experience that, as you said. But when you live here and the sense of charity in this town, uh, you know, and you, all the organizations and all the people you help, it's a pretty special place. So, so uh, you came in. You had never operated a hospitality property before, correct? You're in a really uh, manufacturing yeah, that's correct. I was a manufacturing guy, and uh, yeah, buying into the Golden Gate, it was a small enough place. I was able to kind of kind of accelerate my uh, my education, uh, and I was able to get into the beverage business and into the the table games business and the slot business and the hotel business and the marketing business and uh, and all that type of stuff. And and Golden Gate was small enough that I was able to uh, kind of uh, spend a little bit of time in all these areas. You know, I was very, I was very. Um, um, I would say I'm, I'm, I, I respect greatly that the history of running hotels and casinos, and uh, and I knew I better take uh, take it slow and, and and learn as much as I can because if you don't, you're going to get schooled pretty quickly, you know, involuntarily. So uh, it was great because Golden Gate was small enough, and I was able to spend uh, a, a lot of time there and, and get a good sense of things. And, and that's what I think is is makes you such a great operator, Derek. Is is you didn't. Uh, invest and step back you invested and stepped in <laughs> and, and you actually spent time in kitchens and spent time with bartenders and spent time with housekeepers and went up in guest rooms and, and you know I think anybody who enters business with respect and passion probably is starting in a pretty good place right respect of it and passion for it yeah you know I guess when I came I was 39 years old and uh and and for me I was like okay uh, it's not like going back to college. This was going back to uh, going back to grade school. Let's let's learn and uh, let's go from there. And you know, I I obviously love uh, growing companies. I love building teams, and uh, and and I love Las Vegas. And I I I, uh, I can't believe that so much time's gone by. But uh, but I've loved what we've uh, what, what's happened. And I can certainly tell you, I never would have uh, I never would have thought we'd be in a situation where I could say, okay, we're uh, we're less than a hundred days away. From from uh, opening a property like Circa, um, you know, when I came to Vegas, I always wanted to grow in the business. Um, but, uh, but yeah, this was out. That would have been outside my scope of imagination back in 2006. Yeah. So you know what? What, what uh, the first time I met you was at the D, which is you you want to see an energetic property in Las Vegas, a great party property. The D is unbelievable, and what's incredible about the D is I sat at the bar with you, the long bar downstairs. And uh, it wasn't, oh, there's the owner. No, because Derek is there like every day. He sits at the bar every day, talks to his employees every day, eats the product. You're the host almost. You know, I, I watched you and you're looking at people's faces and you're watching your, your body language. And sure, you're having a cocktail and you're having a good time and you're adding energy to it. But you know, Derek, watching you work as engaged as you are, and as involved as you are in watching the relationships you have with your employees, right? Line level employees, as well as management employees. I think that categorizes you as very special here. And you know, I don't know if that's been told to you, and I'm not trying to make you blush, buddy, I'm not. But you know, as one who walks into all these properties and owns none of them, and one who's an operator, you see who gets engaged and who doesn't. You see who's focused on the numbers in the boxes and who's focused on the facial expressions of their guests. And you're very into the facial expressions of your guests, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, uh, I like I said, I love growing our team and I love, uh, I love meeting customers. So yeah. um, it's kind of special in Las Vegas. You know, you have a special kind of customer. Um, when people make the determination that they're going to give up 48 hours or 72 hours of, uh, of their lives to come to Las Vegas um, and have some fun, um, boy, we got to treat them. We got to treat them with respect. And uh, and what I love is when people come to Las Vegas. It's it's different than when you're going to other cities. Uh, you know, like if you're on a plane and you're coming in, you know, and you're about half hour out of hitting McCarran Airport, there's a certain buzz on that plane. There is than when you're going to other cities and people are excited. And by the time they come here, uh, yeah, I love sitting along, but I love it when when people come running in. They leave their they leave their luggage up by the front desk. They come down, say hi, shake hands, get a drink, all that stuff. Uh, I think that's pretty cool. Uh, it is. And, and you get, I call it belly to belly. You get belly to belly with your customers all the time. 
You know, you're very visible out in your properties. So circa. So now you've bought other hotels, existing hotels. You've done a great job remodeling those hotels, even rebranding the D. So you've now been through all of this process and now you get to build your own baby, right? You're not, you're not restricted to an existing building or existing room sizes or any of those kind of things. I know you're a big sports fan, like a monster sports fan. So you've made sports a big part of Circa. Tell us, you know, what were your personal goals when you, you know, now you're gonna build this massive property, 777 rooms, if I'm not mistaken? Yeah, that's what, that's what it could be eventually, right? Okay, so, so you, you, it's a massive project, right? It, 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 and now you had to have a dream, a vision after these experiences. What motivated you and what was your vision on Circa, Derek? Well, you know, really, I think, I think the thing for me is, um, if you go back to my days at the Golden Gate, we, we listened to a lot of people. And, you know, obviously I've had always my thoughts about, about certain things that I loved about coming to Las Vegas and some things that I wished could be better. And, and, you know, we started implementing a handful of these at the D and then when we bought the downtown Las Vegas event center, we built the downtown Las Vegas event center. We were able to learn a lot over there with all of our watch parties for football and soccer and hockey. And then all the, concerts we did and then the food festivals and I think we got a sense of you know what people really liked and 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 what they had concerns with so we, we kind of took all those things together and then when we started uh, designing up Circa we, we said okay we want this we want this we don't want this and you know this and this so so we were able to kind of put things together um, I guess for me it's maybe a culmination of maybe 20 years worth of uh of, of market of research different events of, of different events that took place that I've been a part of in Vegas. And then with the team we have, um, you know, I would say extraordinarily creative. Um, we decided to come up with uh, a few things that are going to be different. I mean, that's the one thing I think pretty exciting about Circa. Um, and I'm just saying that obviously I'm biased, but, uh, but I'm saying this as, as um, you know, a Vegas fan um, Circa is going to provide a number of things different than what you've seen in some some of the newer casino openings and, and really there haven't been that many. I mean, really you got Cosmopolitan, right. Aria, but we're still talking, you know, we're still going back a little ways. We have wind, you know, you're still going back 10, 20 years. That's right. And then from a design perspective, you're going back, you know, add another five, six years on, you know, earlier than that. So, so I'm excited about having, uh, having uh, a brand new product come to Las Vegas. It'll be, I, I I'm excited. I think it's going to be great for our property. It'll be great for downtown, but it's going to be great for all of Vegas because really what we designed were, were, um, were a number of attractions that, that we think will make people make decisions to say, hey, I'm going to get on a flight and I'm going to come to Las Vegas because I want to see this. I want to see Stadium Swim. I want to see the world's biggest sports book, three-story sports book. You know, I want to see Garage Mahal. All these, hold on, uh, hold on. You can't get through that so quickly. So let's talk <laughs> about the sports book for a sec because I know you're really excited about this. The world's largest sports book, two levels, is it? Uh, three. Yeah. Three, three levels. So yeah. tell us about it. You know, it's one of those things that, that for me, I guess, in my early visits to Las Vegas, I, I still remember walking through the Las Vegas Hilton and seeing that big sports book, yeah. the super book. And I remember going to Caesar's palace, which was a great it. one in its day. Yeah. And going, going, going into Caesar's palace, you know, on the night of a big fight and all the energy and the electricity in the air. I mean, it's something that it's very hard to describe, but if you if you uh, are able to go through it yourself, it's it's pretty amazing. And and I always thought that those were those were like wow moments for me personally in my life that uh you know I'll never forget my first time going to those two places. And and when we designed um, the sports book at Circa, I wanted to kind of create something that had the ability to create that same feeling for someone, uh, but new and updated. So yeah, three story three story sports book, the largest. Uh, the largest in the world. Um, we'll have a television studio for, uh, for, for Vegas sports information with Brent Musburger in there. We'll have, um, you know, a number of radio um, booths and podcast booths from, from the second level. So uh, I think we kind of put a number of things together. Uh, you're going to be able to buy seats to it. Like you're going to a theater and uh, you're going to be able to buy tables. If you got big groups and uh, you're going to have the best watch experience uh, that you, you've ever had. Watch whatever sport it might be, whether you're a baseball fan, football fan, hockey fan. It should be, it should be something special. You know, it's interesting. When, when I pick apart restaurants and bars, and heck, you know, I've had dinner and talked about these things before. You know, pace is really important. 
And some places slow down pace and they want to be stuffy, right? And they raise price because pace is slow. You're very energy sensitive. You like energy. And I've noticed that all of your properties have a real energy level to them. Your staff has a pace to them. So I get what you're saying. I'm really understanding you, Derek, because you love the energy of the sports bar. You want to create that feeling of being in the arena at the game, that excitement, that energy. So you've created the bricks and mortar as a vehicle for the energy. And that's, I'm guessing, I don't know if you ever thought of yourself that way, but you really lean towards energetic environments, energetic places, fun, interactivity. That's why I think your properties in Vegas have a more energetic feel than others. And I say that in an incredibly complimentary way because it's not easy to drive energy like that. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. But uh, yeah, you hit the nail on the head. We, we, uh, we want to make sure that when people walk into one of our properties that they uh, feel it. They, uh, they get, you know, they get hit a little bit on their senses, you know, whether it's audio or whether it's visual, uh, make them, uh, make them feel a little like awestruck that they're in Las Vegas or in this great, great place. And, uh, and, um, yeah, we try to keep a pretty good pace here. Like, uh, it starts with, uh, starts with our whole team and, uh, and then we kind of run from there. I mean, we got to throw a party every night. Like I said, like I was saying, if somebody's going to give us a, you know, 48 hours or 72 hours. And again, whether they're staying with us or not, um, maybe they're just going to come in for a splash for a couple hours. We want to make sure that they walk out of there with a smile like, oh my God, I can't believe it. We want to go home and tell all their friends this is where they work. I think yeah. that's great. You know, I've, I've always, I own the term reaction management. My first book was about reaction management. We say it differently, but we're saying the same thing. You know, I don't believe that you're building a hotel. I don't believe that's the product. The product is the reaction. The hotel is strictly the vehicle. And we don't serve food, we serve reactions. We achieve it through food. And that cook in the kitchen might think he's making a product, but he's not. He's creating a vehicle. The product is how you react to it when it hits the table. And so you're very sensitive in that reactive kind of a way, Derek. And, and so your environments create these emotional reactions inherently. And, and, you know, there's no stuffiness when you walk into your hotels. You know, you really want to have a good time. You really do want to have a drink. You really do want to eat. You really do want to sit with your buddies. And I think it's this reactive sensitivity that you have as an operator. And I say this to anybody else who's operating their own business. You can't have that sensitivity if you're not engaged. That doesn't happen sitting in an office on the top floor. That happens downstairs at the long bar looking in people's faces and interacting with customers. And I think, Derek, that's what makes you special as an operator. And, and, and I mean that, is this connectivity that you have with your customers and the way that they feel. Okay, next. You ready? I got to ask you this. Talk yeah. to us about the pool, because I've heard rumors about the Circa pool, and, and I want to hear it from the horse's mouth. So tell us about it. Yeah, you know, I've always been uh, an outdoor fan, and uh, um, an outdoor fan when I'm talking about uh, pools and uh, and some of the uh, some of the great venues in Las Vegas. But I've always wondered, and this goes back a long, long time. I've always wondered, you know, this goes back to when maybe um, Ben Siegel, the, you know, designed the flamingo and and the pool was always considered just an amenity to a hotel. And, and I always wondered, why did it have to be, particularly in Las Vegas? You know, it was only, it was only recently were there really destination pools, um, you know, such as Wet Republic yep, or yep. Encore Beach Club. I mean, those are destination pools. I mean, obviously, some people at MGM or some people at Wynn will, will stay at the hotel and then go to those, go to those um, day clubs. But really, the majority of their customers are coming from outside the hotel. I mean, Encore Beach Club is not a, not a place where you show up with a room key yep. and you get in. Yep. So, uh, you know, my thought always was, was that Las Vegas is probably the best city in America for, for being out at a pool. I mean, whether 335 days of sunshine a year, um, it's, it's terrific. So why do we have to design just a pool as an amenity for a hotel? I think we've kind of designed something, you know, the other way around. So Stadium Swim um, is what we announced. Um, it's a multi-tiered uh, aqua theater with the wow. largest outdoor screen, I, I believe. I, I don't know. The largest outdoor screen in Nevada, I believe. I, don't, I know it's pretty damn big. <laughs> 140, 143 feet long. And, uh, you know, we've got six pools, um, a couple of big jacuzzis will be open 365 days a year. And like I said, it's multi-tiered, so it's a theater. So we're going to open Circa Las Vegas, the hotel, 
with 512 hotel rooms and we, we shelled out seven floors. So we'll make the call a year later on whether we want more standard size rooms or more suites and things like that. Gotcha. But again, we're opening with 512. Well, Stadium Swim, you know, our pro forma has us doing 4,000 people a day. So this is kind of like a destination attraction. And it's one of the attractions that I think that'll bring people to Las Vegas. Um, I don't think there's any greater place. If you're a golf fan, I don't think there'd be any greater place to get a cabana and, and with all your buddies and watch the Masters. I don't think uh, there'd be a better place to ever watch a Golden Knights playoff game or uh now, you know, with baseball, a 60-day 60, 60 sprint yeah. here in this uh, baseball baseball uh, season, what a great place to watch a Dodgers game or, or something like that. So it's it's sports orientated. It's um, it's going to be heavily musically influenced, so it's going to have high energy. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you're out there during the day, you're going to get some great sun. And if you're out there at night, you're going to have some uh, great viewing and, and just the ability to be outside. And some great entertainment combined with it. Wow. So, you know, it's interesting. And what you said was really powerful, Derek. And now I'm seeing the benefits of it. When, you know, when you you buy a car today, the technology is about eight years old, right? By the time they get it to market. So what you've done is in the past two years, you've infused all new technologies, new thoughts. You're very market research oriented. You're also a very optimistic guy by nature, aren't you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You can say that. I've always been, uh, I've always been that guy uh, kind of, uh, you know, positive or positive, you know, in in my general sense. I mean, I love getting up in the morning. I love getting after it. And uh, yeah, I mean, things, things evolve. Consumers change. You know, at one point when we were designing this um, stadium swim concept, one of my biggest concerns was, well, how are people going to fully experience it and be able to make a bet? Because I do think making a bet on a, on a sporting event, even if you're not a big sports better, but if you put 20 bucks, if you're not a sports better and you put 20 bucks on something, it kind of makes the game a little bit better. It's a lot more fun. Right. And they'll do it yeah. again. Cause it is fun. Yeah. So, so I always thought, well, how are we going to get people to be able to make a bet? But really what's transpired in the last three years is the fact that the use of the phone apps is really just exploded yeah. in, in Las Vegas. And, and, and the thing that really hit me, hit me pretty hard, I would say about a year and a half ago, Um, was the fact that we're seeing it's not just locals that are signing up to like the circus sports um, app. You could play anytime you're in in the state of Nevada, um, you know, which is what a lot of people thought that'd be the majority of the customers. But what I found to be very interesting is when people fly into Las Vegas, whether they're coming from Ohio, Michigan, uh, coming in from California, oftentimes they're going right to the sports book and they're downloading the app and they're funding it. So that way, while they're in Las Vegas, let's say they're going to a show or going Having to dinner, a dinner, yep. going to a concert, they could get their plays in all the time. Yeah. So I was a little bit surprised at how often and, and the frequency of that. And then that kind of helped us play into the whole element of stadium swim. Like, I don't have to worry about people getting their bets in because, because everyone's going to have the ability to have the app on their phone and be able to make their plays in their in-game wagers, things like that. So I think, I think that's something that really kind of played into the whole design of stadium swim. Well, you know, it's interesting years ago in the late eighties, my consulting company, we were the ones who closed all the restaurants in the top floors of hotels across America. And my company, you know, consulted to the hotel industry. This is when we actually got very successful was in the mid to late eighties. And what we would go in is, is, uh, uh, with these restaurants is, is we would eliminate the top four. We would completely change their operating models. And, and, you know, some of the operating models that we would focus on was some of the very things that you're focusing on now. But the fact of the matter is what you're doing is back then guest amenities included restaurants and bars and pools. None of them were profit centers. So by saying this was a guest amenity, what you've done is you've created a profit center in your pool too, because you have revenue opportunities of seeing shows, using the sports app, buying drinks, buying food. So you've created a whole different model. And what people, you know, sometimes don't understand when, when, when great operators say this is the word amenity means I'm not making money on it. <laughs> it's yeah. really the, the, the lines behind the whole premise of an amenity so taking an amenity and turning it into the profit center now you can take the dollars from that profit center and create a far better experience and and create something that's really really special so we've been through hell the past six months uh, uh, all of us you know in in this pandemic and jointly what we've been through and 
You know, I've watched our city that I love, just like you, Derek, get devastated. And, you know, I can't forget the imagery weeks ago of driving down the strip and seeing every casino closed. I know you saw it too. And the boards on every door and, and seeing Fremont closed off. You couldn't even walk down. And, and, you know, I cried when I saw that. It's a powerful thing. And, and, you know, we know the people who work in these casinos and the lives that depend upon it and how we as a city really live to make people happy. That's what we do every day is we make people, it's a special place. And now I feel we're starting to come out of it. And, you know, I, I, I don't want this to turn negative because that's not where I'm going there. But, you know, I've said that when we look at society, a third of the population comes back quickly. They're the younger group. They're sort of fearless. They come out really quickly. The second group of the population is sort of reserved. They're going to watch and see what happens with the first ones for a couple of weeks, and then they'll jump in. And then there's the third group of the population, which tends to, I call them the certain group. They're going to wait till there's a vaccine in place. Now, we know that there's really close now, right? The Oxford vaccine and a few others are looking at September, October, November. Clearly, by the first of the year, I think we start coming out of this. Uh, uh, how do you feel about Vegas as a destination in the future? Well, I think, I think Las Vegas um, as a destination in the future, um, I think Las Vegas is going to have a great comeback because I still firmly believe that, um, that, that people want to be around other people. I think the, the element of where the comeback is going to be slower has to do with some of the um, business connection. What I mean by that is predominantly the, the convention, convention business. business. Yep. Vegas has become very dependent upon the convention business, and I think the convention business will have um, a little bit of a longer lag because in the convention business, like you just said on the three, three groups, you need all three groups. You, you need, you need, you need the, the that last group you mentioned, the, the, certain group, the, yep. the ones that feel certain to feel good about, about uh, traveling and, uh, and coming out to a convention, being around other people. Um, I think, I think that's, that's the element that's going to be a little bit of a slow ramp up for Las Vegas. But I, but I can certainly say that I think um, what I've seen here since since Vegas reopened on June 4th, I think um, you've seen the consumer change a little bit. Um, everyone's very respectful about wearing masks. I think I think society as a whole has changed quite a bit in the last five weeks, actually. And and I think um, I think you're going to start seeing um, a, a pretty significant comeback to Las Vegas. But that's based upon that's based upon some of these numbers coming down. Yep. Without the numbers coming down, um, this is just going to continue to uh, to be to be very very difficult. Yeah. But if the numbers come down, um, it certainly seems as if there is a significant amount of pent up demand. Um, you know, for people to to want to be able to get out and, and to people for people to really want to be around one another in, in in a social setting. Once everyone can feel that both they are safe and um, and they're not putting anyone else in jeopardy. I, I completely agree. I think we're going to come back, and I think we're going to come back pretty strong. And I also think that, you know, the old cabin fever rule is going to apply. People can't wait to get out and have some fun. And, and, and so I completely agree with you. You know what else is interesting is when you look at the international travel impact, you know, I think that Americans are not going to be engaging in international travel as much. And I think that people are going to be much more engaged in domestic travel. I think that's going to have a very positive impact on Las Vegas, right? Because I think international travel becomes less of an option for many people. And when we look at the numbers, you know, we're at about 42 million visitation. You know these numbers as well as me. About 6.7 million a convention, right? So that's really challenging. What worries me is as you and I are sitting here, the digital world is trying to steal that business for us. They're creating virtual trade show floors, virtual sampling systems, virtual this, virtual. So, you know, I think in a way we are competing with the digital world, but I think Circa is the model that changes that. Because when you're focusing on energy, Derek, like you are, and experience like you are, and providing real perceived value to guests that's experiential and product and environment and attitude, you overcome all those things. And, and you know, at the end of the day, I'm guessing because it's yours that Cirque is going to create a reaction that overcomes those things when people see it and see the interactivity of the staff. So I'm with you, buddy. I, I look at this positively as well. I think around the first of the year we're going to kick in, and I think uh, Vegas is going to come back really, really strong. And I think it'll take three years for the convention business to come back over time, I think. But I think tourism is going to jump right in. I'm with you. 
Yeah, I think people want to go out and travel, and I think you're right. I mean, all, all, all the European vacations, South American vacations, uh, I think there's going to be um, a, a little bit of a slow jump to that. But people still want to want to go somewhere. So I do think, like, Hawaii has struggled very, very mightily Much, yeah. um, over the course of the last five five months or so. And I think Hawaii is going to come back. Las Vegas is going to come back. And, uh, again, it's all predicated on these on on, on, uh, on what happens with COVID and, and, and the rate of the decline and how people feel. But I do think uh, domestic travel and domestic tourism um, is is prepared to, to really skyrocket. And I would also say this to, to our listeners. And, and, you know, Derek is a perfect example. I can think of no city that's better equipped to safely deliver an experience than Las Vegas. We are really good at this. We feed millions of people a year. We serve millions and millions of drinks per year. We have millions of safety procedures. We've been dealing with bacteria since our inception. We are really good at this, Derek, and I know your properties are too. So, you know, to listeners uh, uh, that want to be assured, you know, we as a destination, we're doing everything. And when I speak to friends like you who are running these properties and I say, so what are you guys doing? The answer is everything we can think of, John. That's what we're doing. And, you know, the state minimums mean nothing to us and the CDC minimums mean nothing. We've exceeded everything in every way. So, you know, I think Vegas is going to get known for that, Derek. And I think that our safety and the way we're going about this is going to get known. And I think that the future of hospitality has changed. I'll go to my second favorite hotel, if I trust it more than my first favorite hotel post pandemic. So I I couldn't agree more. I agree completely. So the future of our industry is trust and trust is built by transparency and transparency comes from looking in the eyes of owners like yourself who are committed to this and seeing the procedures and the policies that are in place to protect us all. Fact of the matter is we will develop that trust as a destination. And I think that's an exciting opportunity for us going forward. Yeah, I would agree. I think I think what's what's happening in uh, in the Las Vegas uh, hospitality industry is, is is pretty special. I think uh, you know we've all learned from one another, and um, we're all on a lot of group uh, group calls. So how can we how can we make people feel more safe? How can we how can we make people more safe? What, what else can we do? And uh, and I think um, by doing that collectively, it's 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 really enhanced um, you know Vegas as a whole. Yeah, I, thought, I think that's also a unique quality of Vegas is the way the industry will get together and diehard competitors will work together in the interest of the city. Derek, this has been a pleasure, buddy. You know, I, thank you for taking the time. I know you're busy and, and, and this is a crazy time for us all, but I love when we can get together every few months and talk. Yep, very good. Thanks a lot for having me on, John. And uh, yeah, we're less than 100 days to Circle Las Vegas, so uh, we're getting close and we're fired up about it. All right, I'm going to corner you. I want to use one of those podcast booths and get you to podcast at Circle one week, okay? Perfect, perfect. Great. All right, Take care, see you Derek. later. Well, you know, if you had the chance to look in Derek's eyes like I did, you'd realize how passionate and how much this guy loves. Here's what I learned from this conversation. If you go into an industry, you respect. And if you go into business with people, you respect. And you respect your employees. And you take that respect and you blend it with passion. I think you're successful, Corey. I think respect causes you to treat things in a very thoughtful way, a very conscientious way, a very deep way. You don't take things for granted. And passion drives the energy to fix things, make things better, build things, develop things. So we need to respect the world that we're in. We need to respect the things around us. Not everything. I'm being broad in this sense. But if you don't respect the product that you sell, you're never going to do it well. If you don't respect the people that you work with, you're never going to do it well. I mean, Corey, you know I respect you. I love you. You know, there's a respect that causes us to care about each other. When I respect you, I'm going to treat you more carefully. I'm going to care about you more. I'm going to be more thoughtful in a way. If I didn't respect you, I don't give a shit. Right. You know, and suddenly I'm not treating you with respect. And so when we respect something, we become good at it. We become more thoughtful. So... What is it when we go through these transitions, and this pandemic is going to cause them for some of us, what is it that we respect that we can be excited about? How do we respect our industry? How do we respect what we sell? How do we respect each other more? And how do we understand that coming at all of this, whether it's professional or personal, coming at anything from a position of respect is the way to start anything. First, I respect you. 
until you do something that makes me disrespect you. First, I respect what I do before there's a reason to disrespect it. And you know, that's what the powerful message that I got from Derek Stevens today was when he said, I really respected the gaming industry. I really respected this business. So that respect, I believe, drove his success. Talk to you next week. Bye. Subscribe to the John Tapper Podcast right now for more episodes every Thursday.